pieces of it. So hope you guys enjoy. So first I want to talk a little bit about the society that we live in. And because I feel like we're pretty reactive, a pretty reactive society. So we typically wait for things to go wrong or to happen with our health. And then we go and visit with the doctor. A lot of times the doctor then prescribes us medications and uh, there may, a lot of times those medications are just kind of treating the symptoms. They're not actually treating the root cause of the problem. So, and then a lot of times those medications can then go on to cause like other complications or nutrient deficiencies. So it's just super important, as you can kind of see on the right hand side there, there's the top three causes of death in the United States are related to poor diets and physical inactivity. And then the number six cause of death is diabetes complications. So also related to nutrition and lack of physical activity. And those rates are expected to increase over the years. So we really do have the ability to at least be able to slow the onset of these conditions. I know sometimes patients or clients will say, you know, well, my mom has diabetes or high blood pressure or my dad. And so I know that that's just my fate, but that's not true. There's a whole science, a whole study of epigenetics, which is how the environment impacts our genes. And within epigenetics is a whole study of nutrigenomics, which is the study of how nutrition impacts those genes so they can turn those genes on or off. Um, so, of course, I cannot promise you that if you follow all of these guidelines that you're never going to come across any conditions or disease states or anything like that. But I can promise you that your quality of life, the energy that you have, how you feel, um, it, it will definitely help with all of that stuff. And there is possibility that we can at least delay the onset and possibly even prevent the onset of certain diseases and complications through nutrition and other lifestyle parameters. So this is just a little outline of the things that we're gonna talk about today. And I just wanna preface everything by saying that, you know, nutrition really is not a one size fits all. And so the recommendations that are outlined in this presentation are recommendations based on evidence-based research that's you know, looking at a population of healthy individuals, their um, numbers that we use as um, dietetic professionals to help guide us in our practice. But also there are times when maybe we go outside of these ranges. The ranges themselves are pretty big. And so everyone's needs really are different. So I just wanna preface by saying it's always great, especially if you do have any you know, medical conditions or taking any medications, maybe you're in a stage of life where you're post-pregnancy or post-surgery or something like that. It's always great to, to speak with your registered dietitian about your specific needs. So that way you're not just doing what your friend's doing or maybe what your trainer told you to do or something like that, but really seeking out advice from someone who's been trained in it. So first we're going to talk about what is a balanced diet comprised of. So your nutrition is a combination of seven main groups. We have our macronutrients, which those are the nutrients that our body requires in larger amounts. So proteins, carbohydrates, fat, and then water. Water doesn't provide us with energy per se, but it is something that we require a very large amount of, we aren't gonna talk a ton about water today, but just know that your body is comprised of a decent amount of water, like 60 to 70%. So of course it's very important that we're bringing water into the body. Those macronutrients, we're typically gonna see those measured in grams because they're a little bit bigger than those micronutrients on the bottom half there, the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and phytonutrients, which you'll typically see measured in milligrams or micrograms. Um, so those macronutrients, those are like the energy components. That's what's gonna supply our body with energy and other things. We're gonna talk about those other things. But the micronutrients don't supply us with energy per se, but they're little helpers or we call them cofactors for all the different processes that go on in the body. So say whenever you eat your food, you have to turn that into energy for your body in order to do that you have to have certain vitamins and minerals. So they're the helpers. 
So it's important whenever we're talking about a balanced diet that we're incorporating all types of foods, all types of macronutrients and micronutrients, remembering that each food has its own nutrient profile and different nutrients that it's gonna supply us. So we're gonna start with protein. So I feel like protein has gotten the least bad rap out of all the macronutrients. If any of us, any of you joined us for our carbohydrate talk uh, a couple of months ago, do you know um, carbohydrates and probably already know anyways, carbohydrates and fat have kind of tended to get a bad name over time. But protein, I feel like everybody seems to love protein. And if anything, people are typically eating too much protein. But protein is super important. So we need to definitely include it. Proteins pretty much regulate every function in our bodies somehow because those amino acids, which are the building blocks for proteins, are you know part of antibodies, they're a part of hormones, they're a part of enzymes. So those enzymes are cofactors too that are gonna speed up processes or help with processes. They're structural, so proteins are structural units for like our muscles. So all, all kinds of things that we need protein for. So of course protein is very important. protein do we need to eat? Um, you can see on the left hand side we have RDA which stands for recommended dietary allowance and then on the right hand side which are the ones we're going to focus on is the AMDR which is acceptable macronutrient distrib distribution range and again these are ranges that are based on evidence-based research stating that these are you know percentages that are going to be what's best for um, the average healthy individual. So again, if you have anything going on, then you may be outside of these ranges. Um, to give you a, an example kind of with protein anyways, within these ranges, so say if you're um, an older woman who's pretty petite in size, not super active, more sedentary, maybe you're gonna be on that lower end of the protein amount. But if you're, say, a bodybuilder, you're a man, or even like, say, a little bit younger man, maybe like around 30, you're in the gym all the time, like two to three hours, and you have a lot of muscle mass to support, then you're going to be a little bit on the higher end. And we could take like disease states, for example, so like chronic kidney disease, stage two, stage three, we're wanting to really... Um, preserve the kidneys so they don't make it to the next stages. So we see like a lower amount of protein that we're gonna to wanna to recommend for something like that. But say you're on hemodialysis then with chronic kidney disease in stage five, we're actually gonna to need to, for you to have a lot more protein because with that hemodialysis, we're gonna lose some of the protein. So again, everyone's needs are gonna be completely different. That's why it's so important that you speak with a registered dietitian about this. But to give you an example, using these numbers, so it says 10 to 35% of energy intake coming from protein. So say we're gonna, you know, say a 2000 calorie diet, and again, everyone's actual energy needs are gonna be different, of course, too. But we're just gonna take 2000 as an example for easy math, because I'm not the best at math without my calculator. And so 2000 calories, 10% of that is 200 calories, and we know that there's four calories per gram in protein. So we'll divide that 200 by four, and then we get 50. So 10% of 2,000 calories would be 50 grams of protein to kind of break down the math for you. So what are the best protein options? So you I know there's quite a bit of buzz out there about plant-based diets. So there are definitely plant proteins and then we have just animal proteins as well. So on the left, you'll see lean animal proteins and on the right-hand side, you'll see some of the plant-based protein options. Now, when it comes to proteins, their proteins are made up of amino acids and they're, depending on the textbook you look at, there's 20 or 21 amino acids. Nine of those are essential, meaning that we have to obtain it from out, 
from our diet. So our body is amazing and can actually make all kinds of things from different molecules and nutrients in the body. Um, it can actually reuse proteins, so it'll break proteins down and rebuild them with those amino acids in different sequences. It can do all kinds of stuff, but there are nine essential amino acids that it is not able to make, and so we have to get those from our diet. So on the right hand side are the plant proteins and a lot of times you'll hear people say that plant proteins are incomplete proteins, meaning that they don't have all of those nine um, essential uh, um, want to say essential fatty acids, but we're not on fats now um, essential amino acids. And so the ones on the right, the plant proteins, they're lacking at least one of those essential and so essential amino acids. And so if you combine plant proteins, you're able to make it so that it is a complete protein because then you're able to pair two plant-based proteins that have different amino acid composition and make it, you know, so it is a complete protein. Or even if you're just bringing in a variety of different plant proteins through the day, then that's fine too. We'll talk at the end about how important variety is, but I can't stress how important variety is, no matter if you're completely plant-based, if you're partially plant-based, um, but definitely getting variety in the diet is going to be helpful. And what's great about plant proteins on top of it already providing the protein, of course, is that a lot of those plant proteins are also going to supply us with essential fatty acids. So we'll talk about what those are here in a little bit once we get to fats, but they're going to supply us with that sometimes. So like the chia seeds, flax seeds, um, walnuts, they all provide us with protein, but then they also provide us with those essential fatty acids as well as dietary fiber, which we will also talk about because we all know how much we love dietary fiber. Um, and then on the left, so if you're choosing animal proteins, just making sure that we're choosing those lean options. So we'll talk about fats uh, whenever we get there, but animal proteins typically have the most saturated fat as opposed to plant proteins, with the exception of coconuts. Coconuts are typically pretty high in saturated fat. But those ones on the left, the animal proteins, we're just wanting to choose lean protein sources most of the time. So that way we're still getting the protein, we're getting the complete protein, all those amino acids, but we're not taking in as much of the saturated fat. So if you're gonna get lean ground beef, maybe doing like a 90-10. I know at Tailored Bites, we do a 90-10. For our ground turkey, we do a 93-7. Uh, we typically do skinless chicken breasts as opposed to chicken thighs. Um, choosing like a sirloin over a ribeye. And of course, that doesn't mean that you don't ever have chicken thighs or ribeyes or things like that. But just on, you know, whenever we're talking about nutrition, we're wanting these choices to be our choices most of the time. But of course, we have to take in consider into consideration things that also fuel our soul and provide more than just the actual physiological need that our body has. So, um, Okay, there we go. So what are the functions of carbohydrates? Now we're on to carbohydrates and the power of carbs. So brain power, of course, carbohydrates are our brain's preferred source of energy. Uh, carbs saves the protein. So remember, we talked a little bit about all those functions that proteins are involved in. Protein is a functional nutrient, meaning that it is just you know, acting functionally in those processes. There's no storage for protein or anything like that. So whenever we eat carbohydrates, we're saving the proteins to be able to do what they need to do. Because if we don't have um, enough carbohydrates coming in, then your body's going to use those proteins to make blood glucose because that's what's most important first is supplying your brain with glucose, supplying your muscles and your liver with glucose. So that bringing carbohydrates in spares proteins to do what they need to do. Um, helps you poop. We'll talk more about that whenever we get to the dietary fiber slide, but super important in helping us to be regular with our bowel movements, which being regular with our bowel movements is very helpful and good for us too. That's a way for us to rid ourselves of toxins that are passing through the body. Um, and then of course energy. So it's our brain's preferred source of energy. It's our muscles preferred source of energy. We need carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are amazing, but um, how much do we need? It, 
typically depends. So the range, the AMDR range is 45 to 65% of total energy intake. So just like proteins, carbohydrates are, are four calories uh, per gram. So say we we'll use that 2000 calorie example again, and we're gonna choose 50% because that's gonna make it easy math. 50% of 2000 calories is 1000 calories. We divide that by four and we get 250 grams. So that would put you at 250 grams of carbohydrates needed. Now, two big bullet points that really want you to take in are the AI for fiber, which we're gonna have a little chart on fiber here in a minute that will say it again. But if you're not familiar with dietary fiber or you're not someone that's paid a lot of attention, I would recommend writing these numbers down and working towards striving to get to, um, to these numbers. And then of course, sugar. So a max of 10% of our total in, um, energy intake coming from added sugar, I wanna add. So added sugar is not sugar found in fruit, but like added sugar would be, you know, chocolate in the chocolate milk or um, a lot of just processed foods have added sugar added to them. So it's just important that we're always paying attention. The um, food labels now are mandated that it says how much sugar has been added. So that way you're able to finally know that now if it's a natural occurring sugar or is it a sugar that's been added. And the big reason for this, you no know, sugar is not evil, but whenever we're constantly bringing in energy that has no micronutrients associated with it, so no vitamins, no minerals, no dietary fiber, nothing else that's like health promoting, it's just energy and we're just just bringing that in, we'll, we see that you know processes start to get kind of out of whack, including the metabolism, because they just don't have what they need to do what they need to do. And we'll talk about that more here in just a minute. But um, big ones for di under carbohydrates are dietary fiber, and then the sugar are things that you're really wanting to pay attention to. And just like proteins, not all carbohydrates are created equal. On the left-hand side, you have the simple carbs on the right hand side, you have complex carbs. Now, whenever I look at the left side, I think about, you know, birthday parties, I think about graduation, celebrating wins for games and, you know, like just events and, and things. And, and then that makes me think about, you know, the emotional connection that a lot of us have to those foods because of that, is that's typically what we are, we see at those things. So that's not, that there's anything wrong per se with eating those items, you know, on occasion or even, you know, including them daily into your intake, but we truly have to watch the portion size of those and make sure that that's not something that's happening all the time, all the time, because again, we need those micronutrients, we need the dietary fiber, um, our body needs that if it's going to operate the way that it really wants to operate. So on the right hand side, you have complex carbohydrates. And those are, you know, fruits and vegetables and lean, uh, or not lean, but, um, you know, whole grains and beans and legumes. So they're providing us not only with that sustainable energy because it has dietary fiber in there that's going to help to keep our blood sugar more regulated, but it also has, they all have their own set of different micronutrients that they're also offering to your body. And almost all of them are really low in fat as well and low in added sugar. I mean, really none of them are going to have added sugar. You just have to be careful of cereals, you know, and some of them will have a little bit of sugar added, but of course we can pay attention to the nutrition facts label and find ones that don't have as much sugar and that do supply us with a little bit of dietary fiber to be eating on a regular basis. Now, if you want to have some cinnamon toast crunch every once in a while, of course that's fine too. And again, we have to, you know, have balance in our life and you know, enjoy foods that we're eating, but I really, there's a lot of amazing, you know, healthy foods that taste so wonderful too, and that can be cooked in amazing ways that you just die over it. It's so good. And, and yes, those ones on the left are, are things that maybe a lot of us true, you know, enjoy. And I think a lot of it is because of that emotional connection surrounded around that. So, 
not all carbohydrates are, no carbohydrates, I don't wanna say anything is bad, but it's not all carbohydrates are created equal. So we really do, for the most part, need to be choosing more of those complex carbohydrates on the right side. So dietary fiber is king or queen. I always think I wanna change that up there to include queen, um, but health benefits, so next month, we're actually going to have a presentation with Valley Sleep Center on uh, gut health. So we're going to talk a ton about dietary fiber then because that's a big key player in all of that. Um, but there's a ton of health benefits surrounding uh, dietary fiber intake. You can see some of those on the left-hand side. And then on the right, we have the AIs again for total fiber. So if you didn't find your number last time, now's the time to find it and jot it down. And that can maybe be you know, something that you start working on starting tomorrow of just ways to incorporate more dietary fiber in your diet. Um, again, we'll talk more about this next month, but you know, anything from helping you to feel fuller longer, so that way you have sustainable health promoting weight loss to helping to um, lower blood uh, cholesterol, there, and just our gut health, the impact that it has on our gut health. Dietary fiber is the food for those gut microbes in there, and, um, and we need that our, our intestinal tract to be colonized well with those gut bacteria, so they need good food coming in. So complex carbohydrates are going to provide you with that. But I just want to you know, warn or caution, if you're not used to eating those amounts that are on the chart, make sure that you ramp up slowly. It's If you do too quickly, you can definitely cause some GI distress. Also, make sure you're getting a combination of both dietary fibers. So there's soluble and insoluble dietary fiber. Soluble, and just exactly like it sounds, it's soluble, meaning that it attracts water, it absorbs water. Um, so if we're having too much of that, and if we're not drinking enough water, you can think of it as just becoming like a gel and getting stuck, which is then whenever we may experience constipation. On the flip side of that, you have insoluble, so cannot attract that water, so it's more like pellets kind of pushing through and can speed up. Um, the, so that way we may have diarrhea. So want to make sure that you're taking in both of both types of fibers and making sure that you're increasing your fluid intake as you do so. And I also want to note, because I hear so many times and people say, okay, well, I'm just going to go out and get these fiber bars because of course, all food companies are all over any type of buzz that's in the wind about, oh, this nutrient people are now concerned about, or this is, they're concerned about this. And so they're going to be throwing fiber and everything, putting that on the label. And we just want to be making sure, of course, some of your dietary fiber can come from those foods, but the big takeaway is that you're eating more whole foods. So you're eating more fruits, you're eating more vegetables, you're eating more whole grains and beans and legumes and nuts and seeds, all of those are going to provide you with dietary fiber. You don't need to go out and buy, you know, foods that have dietary fiber infused into them. In, in fact, I would recommend that you just eat whole foods. Um, okay, so fats. We're on to fats. The power of fats support cell growth. Um, energy. This is one that probably a lot of us don't like the most. So adipose tissue is our body's main storage of energy and it stores fatty acids or triglycerides as that energy. Um, I always like to talk though a little bit about that because really from an evolutionary standpoint, those of us who are very efficient burners, meaning that we don't maybe require as much energy and we have an ability to be able to store energy very well. From an evolutionary standpoint, that's really a good thing, right? Like we would have made it through a lot of famines without ability, but because of the world that we live in now and the environment that we live in, where there's a fast food restaurant on every corner and we're just, we have all kinds of food, 9,000 choices available to us every day, then it's a little bit problematic. But if you think about it, it really is a good thing. 
and then absorb nutrients. So we know that there's fat soluble vitamins, there's A, there's D, E, and K, and they all are gonna require some fat in the diet to be able to be absorbed properly. And then of course regulates hormones. So fats are precursors for hormones. Um, so it's super important that we're making sure that we're getting enough dietary fat in our diet so that way we can have good hormonal health as well. So just like carbs and proteins, of course, not all dietary fat is created equal. So on the left-hand side, there's just a little chart there of um, different types of fats. So the ones that are in the green, the polyunsaturated and the monounsaturated, green for go means eat more of those. Saturated fats in yellow, so slow down a little bit. And then trans fat, we want to typically avoid. Most foods, to my knowledge, have been completely banned if they or they cannot have trans fat in them, but I would still just look on your label just to make sure because who knows really. Um, with the saturated fat, we're wanting 10% or less of our diet coming from saturated fat. Most of the time you're going to find saturated fat or larger amounts of saturated fat in animal products. For the most part, all foods have like a variety of different fatty acids. So there's some plant, um, plant products that have some saturated fat in it, but for the most part, those plant uh, foods are going to be higher in the polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fat. And just like the uh, proteins with fats, we have essential fatty acids, uh, which is alpha linoleic acid and linoleic acid, which is down on the right hand side there. Um, the alpha linoleic acid can be converted to EPA and DHA as well, which are also um, part of those essential fatty acids, but it's not as great of a um, conversion. So that's why it's so great that we're getting those from food sources. And to give you some examples for um, EPA, that's going to be found in like fatty fish. So salmon's a great uh, resource for that. And then for DH, DHA, then we're going to be finding that more in like plants. So nuts and seeds are going to be more, especially like walnuts, flax, chia, um, pumpkin seeds are going to be great for bringing that into the body. So the AMDR for fat is 20 to 35. And remember, we just talked about saturated fat being 10% or less of that. So then you're wanting the remainder of that to be coming from those two top ones, the polyunsaturated and the monounsaturated fats, which are typically you're going to find mostly in plants. So olive oils and olives and avocados and nuts and seeds and things like that. So again, kind of going back to the protein side, we choose those lean protein sources. They don't have as much fat and then maybe we add some avocado to the meal or we sprinkle the meal with some pumpkin seeds or some hemp seeds or something like that or drizzle some olive oil, some flavored olive oil or something on there to really spice it up. But that way we're still getting the fat that our body requires. We're making sure we're getting those essential fatty acids that our body otherwise would not have access to. And then we're leaving out some of that saturated fat that has been linked with heart conditions um, and that again it's not that you can't have any but we just want to keep that to a smaller amount. It keeps getting sticky on me. Okay. So um, now we're on to the micronutrients. And as I mentioned towards the beginning, micronutrients are um, so vitamins and minerals, and they're going to be those little helpers for all the processes in the body. There is a nice um, pictograph here. That's, I don't know if that's the right word or not, but it's showing you some different uh, essential micronutrients and their function as well as their food sources. To give you a couple examples like the iodine, that's a big one for thyroid hormones. So we want to make sure that of course we're bringing iodine into the body. Um, kind of going back to what we talked about at the beginning, but the food that we eat, if we're going to turn that into energy for our body, we need to make sure we have those B vitamins like thiamine and niacin. Um, so it's super important that we're bringing our vitamin C we can look at that in a lot of different ways but you know more of an antioxidant property so we know environmental stress working out that causes oxidative stress on our body so we need those antioxidants to counter that and help protect ourselves so 
again, kind of going back, we'll go forward, but we're going to be kind of talking about what we talked about a little bit, but it is possible to be overweight and malnourished. And of course, it's possible to be underweight and malnourished. And it's even possible to be of normal weight if there is such a thing and be malnourished as well because we are bringing energy into the body, we're bringing food in, but we're not bringing those, uh, those essential micronutrients into the body as well that are needed for all the different processes that go on, into our, and go on in our body. And so that's whenever we start seeing complications and conditions and things come up. That's not the only thing, but that is a, a big part of it. So you can kind of use this, but just make sure that we're eating you know, as much whole foods as possible. Of course, we can overdo a good thing too. So variety and balance, and we'll talk about that here in a second, but pay, paying attention to, you know, what we are putting on our plate and making sure that it's colorful and we have those fruits and vegetables and we have those whole grains and nuts and seeds and beans and legumes because they're going to be providing us with fiber. They're going to be providing us with those micronutrients. And of course, sugar, we need to be careful because if we are someone that is eating more processed foods, even if they're more healthy processed foods, we still have to be careful because a lot of times those food companies are putting sugar in there because it makes the food taste good. They want you to buy it. They want you to keep coming back for it, which is, I mean, I'm not blaming them, but I'm just saying like that we have to be careful about it and just know that that does exist and that is happening. And, and so we just need to make sure that we're not taking in too much sugar because then that sugar doesn't have its energy, plenty of energy, but no micronutrients associated with it. And then if we have too much energy, not enough micronutrients, that's whenever things start going haywire. So last slide here, what eating pattern is right for you? Again, each of us, it's going to look pretty different, but generally speaking, there's, these are some things, there's some overarching things to kind of shoot for. So adequacy in our diet, um, basically meaning, of course, we need to be getting adequate amounts of all types of nutrients, adequate amounts of protein, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. We need all of it, and we need it in adequate amounts. Um, balance. So balance with those nutrients, you know, where we talked about the AMDR. So those are equaling 100% of our total intake and we're breaking up proteins and fats and carbohydrates with percentages, but all of those are going to add up to that 100%. So we're balancing it that way. We're balancing our meals with micronutrients. We're also balancing our dietary pattern with foods that nourish our soul. Remember those uh, simple carbohydrates on the left? Like those are maybe foods that more nourish our soul because they provide that emotional connection that maybe we had at that birthday party or bring us, you know, a nostalgic feeling whenever we're eating it. So we need that still in our life, you know, for a health promoting lifestyle, we still need to find joy in the foods that we're eating and be comforted at some times with the foods that we're eating as well. But we need a good balance of that because if we're doing too much of that, then that's whenever things get a little bit crazy for us. And calorie control or portion size, I like to say a little bit, uh, I like that a little bit better, but making sure that we're not eating super huge portions, but of course that we're eating enough as well. And then dense with nutrients, so nutrient dense foods, meaning that those foods are foods that are going to provide us with those nutrients relative to the amount of energy. So sugar is not a nutrient dense food. It's a very energy rich food, but it's not a nutrient dense food. But, you know, broccoli would be a nutrient dense food because there's a lot of nutrients that's going to supply you relative to the amount of energy that it supplies you. Of course, moderation. So going back to that balance, if we are bringing in those foods that you know, more nourish our soul. We need to make sure that we're practicing moderation with that. And as well, if whenever we're talking about health promoting foods, we still need to think about moderation. If we're, you know, thinking about one specific food, um, 
like spinach, for example, is one I, I use a lot and because spinach is great. It has so much goodness in it, but it also has oxalates and oxalates can bind um, certain minerals like calcium and zinc. So if we're overdoing that, then we could run our risk of, you know, possibly becoming deficient in one of those minerals. So moderation and of course, variety. Variety is, in my opinion, one of the most important. They're all important, but it's so important that we're getting a variety of foods coming into the body. Remember, each food has its own nutrient profile. And so we, the more variety of foods we're bringing in, the more chances are we're gonna have all the nutrients that we need coming in, as well as we'll talk uh, next month about with our gut health, but just how those gut microbes love such a variety of different um, fibers and foods coming in as well to help colonize that bacteria in there. So, and lastly, small changes in eating patterns can cause great benefits in long-term health. I cannot stress this enough that, you know, after today, it's, you don't need to go out and you know make every single change. In fact, doing and doing so a lot of times kind of backfires on people um, because it's not sustainable. Our brain is not going to recognize all of these new things as rewards if this is not something that we've been doing on you know a regular basis so far. So maybe. My hopes is maybe you would choose dietary fiber to start as like maybe your first goal and start working on getting that number up or maybe you set a goal like I'm going to eat a fruit or vegetable with every meal or if you're not eating any fruits and vegetables at all right now, maybe something more realistic would be, you know, eating a vegetable with my dinner and just slowly starting to compound on top of those behavior changes until you finally get to a point. Actually, I'll take that back because none of us are probably ever really going to get to a point where we're just going to be done because we, as we continue to age and, and evolve as a human race as well, our nutritional needs continue to change. And so we're always probably going to be working on something. I know I've been working on mine for years and years now, and there's still plenty of things that I need to work on to still just keep making that even more of a health promoting lifestyle for myself. So that's all I have for you guys today. But you know, we typically like to hear some questions and answer some questions. And I hope that you guys enjoy. That was great. So much good information. Thank you, Rachel. Of course. So let's see, I'm gonna pull up the questions here. One of the questions was about an app that would help them keep track. And I think I know what you're gonna say. Yeah, that's, I feel like for, the, I think the most advanced one and that has like the most different foods in the database and probably the most easiest to use because it's been around the longest. So they have a lot of backing would be my fitness pal. And so that's a great one for for tracking everything. Again, they have a great database. They have different types of restaurant foods as well as the ability to be able to enter foods in. So I know sometimes whenever clients are getting meals through us, there's a, an ability for them to be able to create that meal. So then they can even plug and play that in the MyFitnessPal as well. But that's typically the one that, um, that I recommend. And we have one that we use, of course, with um, Tailored Bites, but it's it's called NutriHand, but that could be something that, that people could use as well. It's not, the database isn't as big, uh, and we use it for kind of building our recipes and stuff like that as well, but it is something that they could use too. Oh, that's cool. Is that a free app that they can get? Um, I, I think I have to send them the, the key for it to be free. I don't think that it is free. All right, let's see. I had some other questions here that I think. But my fitness pal is. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, they asked about a recording. That'll, the recording of this will be on Valley Sleep Center's uh, YouTube channel. It's Valley Sleep Center, all lowercase. And can you tell us more about your services at Taylor Bites, meals for those with chronic conditions? Do you want to yeah. talk about how does sure. that um, so we have like online ordering and if depending on the patient or the client's um, 
knowledge surrounding their medical condition, they may be able to use the website to be able to, you know, pick their own meals because there is a lot of customization that you can do on the website. So we have like a small size meal or regular size meal. You have the ability to be able to add non-starchy vegetables to your meals. You have the ability to be able to add uh, protein to your meals. Um, you can substitute plant proteins, you can substitute fish. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do on the actual website. We don't use much salt at all whenever we're cooking. So all of our products are very low sodium. Uh, we don't even have sugar in the kitchen. We do have agave and honey. So there is some added sugars that are going in. But um, so with regards to that, uh, if someone maybe is diabetic, maybe they choose And with diabetes, it's hard because everyone really is a little bit different depending on the medications they're on, if they're incorporating physical activity, um, all kinds of things. But Sometimes if somebody is wanting to stick to lower carbohydrate, if that's what they're looking for, choosing that small meal size and then adding some non-starchy vegetables so you're still getting the volume, you're still getting that larger size but not taking in all of those carbohydrates and then maybe adding a little bit of protein to the small size too so that way you're still getting you know, three or four and a half ounces of protein with the meals. But we also have um, tailored meal plans as well and that's where we would set up a consultation, so introductory consultation with one of our registered dietitians, myself or Austin. And then we would you fill out a pre-assessment form and then we go over all of that information with you in the consultation. And then we can actually develop a plan that is more specific um, to you. And you're doing that on telemedicine, right? Like yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mo like most of the time, if so, a uh, client is really wanting to meet in person, we are able to accommodate that now, but uh, the telehealth option is what we prefer to do right now, I guess, or what I feel like most people feel comfortable with, but we are able to set up here in the kitchen with distancing and wearing masks and be able to, to do those as well. So someone asked if you could explain one more time uh, about the grams per day, like how do you figure that out? Okay, so grams per day. So each nutrient, so proteins and carbohydrates both have four calories per gram, and then fats are gonna have nine. And if we're gonna take percentages of those macronutrients um, of our total calorie intake. So first we have to know how much calories we're gonna eat. And then once we know how many calories we're gonna eat, we can divide that up into percentages of macros. So maybe we take, um, you know, 50% carbs, we're going to do 20% protein, and then 30% fat. And so 50% carbs, again, would be, if we're eating 2,000 calories, is going to be a thousand of those calories, and we're going to divide that by four because we know that there's four calories per gram, which is then going to lead us to 250 grams of carbohydrates. And then what did I say? 20% for protein. So 20% of 2,000 is 400, is that right? <laughs> it's 400, and then we know with protein, there's four calories per gram as well, so we divide that 400 by four, which would mean we would have 100 grams of protein, and then if we were gonna do 30% of that 2,000 calories, then that's gonna be 600 calories, and so we're going to divide that by nine because fat actually provides us with nine calories per gram. So it's more energy rich, which is why sometimes we can get in trouble because you can just eat, you know, like a handful of nuts and consume quite a bit of calories in just that one setting. Um, but so say we divide that by nine. So what 600 divided by nine? I don't really know exactly that, but you guys, let me get my phone real quick so I can, or maybe somebody will get it before me. I like the idea of okay. just okay. It out for okay. me. 600 divided by nine. So then you're looking at six, like around 67 grams of fat. 
So you first have to know how many calories you're going to eat, then you're going to decide how much percentage you're going to have coming from each macronutrient group. And then you're going to take that percentage of those total calories you're eating and then divide that by the number of calories per gram, depending on the macronutrient. And again, protein and carbohydrates are going to have four calories per gram and then fats are going to have nine. Okay. Great. So as far as like eating throughout the day, would you recommend how many times that, how many, how many times would you recommend that people eat throughout the day? And then what is your comment on having two bigger meals a day and how late at night can we, can we eat up till to have successful sleep? Okay. So again, everyone is a little bit different with regards to, you know, their nutrition intake and my, what, you know, it, it really, it honestly, it really depends because there's some people where they experience like this low blood sugar or this feeling of like where they feel hungry all of the time. And then I see it all the time. And so for someone like this, I would say eating small, frequent meals through the day. Like if you always feel hungry, no matter what, like if you're eating, you know, large meals, um, then it's, it's fine, but then you're going to feel hungry again really soon, and then you're going to eat another large meal after that because you're just going to feel hungry. So if you're someone that feels hungry all the time, eating small, frequent meals through the day is going to be great for you because you'll eat enough that you don't feel hungry anymore, but you're not going to eat so much that you're going to overdo it with the calories, and then you're going to keep kind of moving on like that. Um, but for some people and you know that everyone's schedules are different So for some people to be eating six meals a day is not like it just wouldn't happen There's no way it would cause them more stress to try and implement that Then and maybe do them more harm than just eating say maybe like three meals through the day um, so really this is going to come down to more what the patient or you know what the client is is wanting but tech i would recommend most of the time especially in cases of weight management and weight loss that we're eating small frequent meals through the day as opposed to eating just two larger meals um, that way we're bringing nutrients into the body on a regular basis i know especially right now things are so stressful and you know having those nutrients available to be able to provide your brain with energy so that way you can at least internalize that stress as a little bit less um, is going to be super helpful and so you're just you're having food come into the body uh, you know on a consistent basis as well as you know, there's some speculation about the amount of protein that's be that's able that's able to be digested at once, or um, just eating too much food in one setting period, and just not having the body not being able to absorb and process and digest those nutrients as well as if it's just coming in on smaller in smaller increments. But again, everyone is different. And then with regards to your question surrounding sleep. Um, this is going to be different for everyone, but you typically research shows you don't want to be eating a large amount of food before you go to bed. And we can think about what we just talked about, about carbohydrates and how that is your brain's preferred source of energy. So if you're consuming these large meals before you go to bed, even though you may think that you sleep well, I've done actually like little studies with several um, clients where they have the, the Apple Watch that actually you know, shows them what their sleep is like over the night. And I, I know probably from Valley Sleep Center, you guys are like, those are not accurate and maybe they're not, but at least probably the same as um, some things that we use in nutrition that's like, oh, I don't know how accurate that really is. But at least it gives us kind of a baseline a little bit and something to, um, you know, put push put things off of or like you know okay well we started here and now it's looking a little bit like this so what we typically see is a lot of times um, clients who are eating more in the evening time and then we switch to more of this eating more frequently through the day and not eating as much towards the end of the day as well as um, definitely not eating large meals right before going to bed and the sleep is so much better and so we know sleep is so important with hormone regulation with with so much and that can then go on to impact other conditions or weight and everything so 
and of course just quality of sleep and feeling energized and good in the morning and you know waking up then so what i see a lot of times is people typically are eating a lot more food in the evening which then they get stuck in this cycle where they're not hungry in the morning and then they may go the whole morning the whole afternoon without eating typically then they just want to raid the entire cupboard and eat everything in there making pretty poor choices so again that's why eating those consistent meals on you know, or the small frequent meals on a consistent basis, in my opinion, for most of us is typically what's going to support you with the, the best energy, with weight maintenance, and with the best health. So meal prep is a big trend right now. And to make it easy, people are cooking and eating kind of like the same breakfast, lunch, and dinners for, say, a week. What's your opinion on eating those same type of meals days in a row? So it's, and I say this a lot in consultations too, because I, I, I don't want to overwhelm anyone on their journey of, you know, with their nutrition to where, you know, everyone's in a different spot, starting spot with where they're at. And so, you know, it could be that to start out like that, as opposed to going through the drive through every day, then that's way better, right? And then, but eventually getting to a point where we're, you know, bringing different foods in and we're not eating the exact same thing every single day for breakfast. We're not eating the exact same thing for lunch every day or for dinner, you know, and if at least if you are doing that, maybe you do that for one week and then the next week you at least, you know, trade up different grains or I know like sprouts is an amazing resource for having variety. If you don't want to, you know, do a meal prep service, you want to do your own meals, you know, using something like sprouts where they have those bulk, um, bulk containers where you can get all different types of grains, you can get all different kinds of beans and not have to buy like big amounts of it. So that way you can, you know, cook different things through the week or you could at least, you know, trade up different things week to week. So that way you're not eating the same thing every, every day. So right. that way you're getting a little bit more variety in your diet. But honestly, we have to remember we just start where we can start. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be, you know, like, feel overwhelmed that you can't get to the end point or the what we're working towards because it just always is those baby steps of just kind of building on the behavior changes and the new dietary patterns that you're bringing in. So however you can start working your way towards that is the way that you should do that. So a couple of opinions, would you give your opinion on two things, keto okay, and what is the rationale behind having like a 12 to 14 hour fasting window? Like an, uh, like a, those are kind of two diets out there that people are doing. Would you give your opinion on each of those? Sure. So ketogenic diet, um, I, so the, in, in training and schooling, we talked about it for more in the pediatric sense. So it's great with helping some children who are having epilepsy or problems with seizures to be able to help them manage that. Um, so I do think that there is some um, medical nutrition needs for possibly for a ketogenic diet with regards to that. With regards to weight loss, I don't ever recommend it. Um, I think, again, we just need to learn how to nourish and fuel our bodies properly with health-promoting foods. They're not diet foods. They're just fruits and vegetables. I know it's hard because we're not taught from a young age, like the true impact that nutrition has on our health and has on our body weight. And so, but what we are taught is this diet culture and this diet society where we restrict, restrict things and we don't eat, you know, certain food groups and things like that, but that's not how it has to be. Um, I've had plenty of patients and clients come in that have been on ketogenic diets for extended period of time that are not having bowel movements for over two weeks periods, which this is not good. Like that's our body's way of being able to rid us of toxins and to know that those toxins and bacteria and all of that is just staying in there. Um, I know that ketogenic is still relatively new, but I look forward to the studies that come out surrounding um, colon cancer, cancers, and um, just things that are going to arise from people really typically just like abusing it. Um, 
And then, and you know, but for some people, they if they want to do it for a short amount of time and it helps to motivate them and get them going and, you know, they're being somewhat careful and not just eating a crap ton of bacon and they're actually being somewhat strategic and making sure they're getting those essential fatty acids in and some sort of vegetables and things like that, then, um, and you want to try that out, then more power to you. But again, you're just learning that behavior when you could be learning the behavior of health promoting balanced eating that's going to be sustainable and is going to be, you know, promote health for you for the long term, which is what we're always looking at at Tailored Bites. And then with intermittent fasting, the same thing applies. So especially um, in the dieting world, we see so many uh, patients and clients with disordered eating and eating disorders. And this, in my opinion, is just another example of that where we're just restricting food for, for periods of time and we're not uh, teaching ourselves how to eat in more of a balanced and health promoting way. And there's there's a lot of links with depression and anxiety. Again, most of the time that means that we're going to be bringing in large amounts of food because we only have, say, an eight-hour window to eat that food in. And so it's pretty hard if you're trying to, if you're a man and you're trying to get 38 grams of dietary fiber in an eight-hour window, good luck to you unless you're just eating a bunch of processed dietary fiber. Like it's very, very hard to do to eat a health-promoting diet um, in such a short period of time. So again, I think it just really goes back to, we need to, to learn and to incorporate those, those sustainable lifestyle behaviors. It's not just about nutrition, it's physical activity, it's sleep, it's stress reduction, it's all of that. And, and be working on that as opposed to these crazed diets where we're doing extreme things to our bodies that can just lead to more complications later on. Like it's just, it's not good for our mental health and it's not good for our physical health as well. All right, thanks for answering all those questions. Of really course. great questions. And I wish you a beautiful evening. Thank you. How do we get a hold of you if we want a consultation? Consultation, um, you can go to www.tailoredbites.com and go to the nutrition therapy tab and then scroll down and you'll see a picture of myself or Austin and you can book it that way. You can also send us an email to services at tailoredbites.com and let us know you'd like to get set up. We also are on Instagram and we have a little community on there and are just always trying to promote uh, nutrition and put some education out there and everything. So give us a follow on there if you haven't or if you're not already, but that's a way you can always send us a message on there as well and just reach out and let us know you'd like to work with us and we'll get you set up. Sign up for their newsletter. It's great. Yes. Yeah, definitely. That will, a window will pop up if you visit our website. Again, that's um, tailoredbites.com and then you can enter in your email and then that way we send out a monthly newsletter and then we send out an order reminder each week, which as a reminder, there's no commitments or contracts ever with our ordering. So and our menu changes each week. So that way you're getting tons of variety. So go pick out your stuff between Monday noon and Wednesday midnight. So submit your order before Wednesday midnight and then you would just come and pick up on Sunday or Monday and have those meals for during the week. So you don't take insurance, but if we have like an HSA card, we could pay for your uh, consultation with that. Is that right? Um, I, to be honest, I need to look into that okay. more. I actually had somebody ask that question the other day and I still need to look into that because I'm so not. If you have a sleep disorder and you want a consultation with Rachel, we can do it through Valley Sleep. Yes, yes. We've seen patients through Valley Sleep Center. So talk to your provider about that, that you would like to talk to Rachel about, you know, getting, getting um, a meal plan or what, you know, just helping you with your weight because uh, sleep, especially sleep apnea patients, if you have any type of obesity, your insurance wants you to be healthy because you cost them more money when you're, when you're not at a good BMI. So let us help you with that. All right. I, you're going to get an email from me, everybody. You can always reach out if you have any questions beyond here that we didn't get answered. Um, if you're on Facebook, please put any comments, questions in the chat, and we'll get an answer for you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye-bye.